your subtitle, my dear. I'm sorry? I like your subtitle. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it started out with the Dr. Strangelove yes. uh, reference. Yep. So, uh, are you all ready? Excellent. So, first off, I want to thank uh, everyone involved in this conference uh, for setting this up and for inviting me to come down here to uh, meet some new friends and to share some knowledge. Before I get started, this is actually a DLP slash data governance talk. You have been warned. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm Micah K. Brown. I am out of the Cincinnati area. I work through my 9 to 5 with Munich Re. I also serve as the Vice President for the Greater Cincinnati ISSA Chapter. This is about my second year uh, doing some talks. I make all of my talks free and open source, so you can just go to my GitHub right there, and you can download any of my three existing talks, and uh, I'm working on some really cool ones for the upcoming years. That being said, I do have my CISSP, and I was fortunate enough to be honored with presenting at this year's DerbyCon, and uh, let me tell you, that was a great experience. Now guys, I'm not a vendor. I have nothing to sell you except to invest in yourself. In Cincinnati, we have four great IT security organizations that all work together to provide a better environment for our IT security practitioners. So if you're ever in Cincinnati, we'd love to have you at any and or all of our events. That being said, this talk is for you. If you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand, shout them out, or hurl fruits or vegetables with outrageous abandon in my general direction. That being said, what is DLP? Data loss prevention, it's not a monolithic policy stack anymore. It's not designed to stop a sufficiently advanced adversary. It is not digital rights management, it is not in user behavior analytics, and it is not a silver bullet. What DLP is, is it's becoming a feature of a lot of diverse and different tools that you may have or you may choose to implement in your environment. It's designed to help enable proper data ownership, data stewardship within your organization. In my personal mind, I believe that DLP is a business tool that may be operated by IT and IT security. I think it's very key that we think of it in that scope. Uh, I think it's a collection of tools that allow the business to define controls on how they store, process, and transmit data in our environment. And so that's exactly what we're going to go through and we'll talk about. How can we go through and apply controls on how we store, how we process, and how we transmit data? Now, your tool set may vary. But in general, you'll have a couple common components. The first one is going to be the DLP client. So this is a small piece of software that sits on each one of your client systems, and it goes through and it performs DLP activities on how your users are interacting with their machine, with your data. The next is a DLP network scanning device. So this is kind of like an IDS or IPS in our environment, except looking it's not looking for the actual malicious attack signatures, it's looking at potentially sensitive information traversing the network that you feed it. Now you can feed these devices, generally you can use spam ports, you can use network tabs, or you can use packet aggregators. The last one's really where you want to be because that's really going to help out and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. The DLP repository scanner is next. So this is a server or service that will go through and you can point at a particular data storage location. This could be a share, this could be a NAS, it could be a SAN, it could be a database, it could be something like a web storage unit, but basically it goes through and it scans every piece of data, every file on that repository, and it'll give you back a report as to what potentially sensitive information it thinks you have there. Now, a cool thing about this is some of these repository scanners, they do allow you to go through and to take actionable information. So, for example, if you had documents that were classified as top secret and you're scanning, say, a public share, you could say, any document that I find that is labeled top secret, please move it over to the secured area. So that's something kind of cool that uh, I'm playing around with professionally, at least in my mind. The next major component is DLP email. 
So this is a server or service that interacts with your mail server. And it'll go through and scan both incoming and outgoing. And I know I get challenged by this all the time. It, data loss prevention. We really care about what's going out. And well, yes, that's true. I also want to know, be able to identify what's coming in that's particularly sensitive, coming in a suboptimal path. That way I can proactively reach out to the business and start a dialogue, not only as an education, but being an enabler of business. Uh, winning that trust that we often have so hard of a time establishing, bringing value to the business. DLP web, it works in much the same way as the DLP email. Uh, usually it's through a WCCP uh, link between your web proxy and your, or in the DLP web device. And this allows you to do DLP activities on all traffic coming into your network and out of your network. Once again, I do believe that DLP both directions is preferable so that we can start to have those educational conversations. And finally, there's the DLP management console. And guys, this one is the scariest of all of them. Because think about it. DLP is designed to go through and to catch some of our most sensitive information in our environment. And when we do find a violation, what do we do? We create an incident. We create an alert. And that incident, that alert, it's going to have generally a copy of the primary information, if not the whole file, as to what was flagged. But it's also going to have secondary information. So if I am an adversary, and I realize that there is a DLP environment, if I get access to those incidents, not only am I going to be able to ask it, hey, show me all incidents with credit card numbers, but I'm also going to get the meta tag, the who created it, the who acted on it, the where was that originally stored. And golly, if I find a single spreadsheet that has 5, 10, 15 credit cards in that uh, file server over there, what's the chance that there's other, going to be other sensitive files there? It's pretty high, actually. And so when it comes to your DLP management console, we need to make sure that you are securing it in a way that is defendable from all of the rules, laws, and regulations that apply to your environment. So let's talk about how these components interact. The first one, the DLP client on your end systems. Uh, this one can be really problematic because the moment that you go through and you put a DLP control on your client endpoints, people are going to go through, and whenever there's a performance degradation, they're going to say it has to be DLP. Now, to address this, what we did is we used a uh, fairly well-known per-process monitor. We installed it on a couple of our IT security uh, workstations that we use every day, and it would go through, and it would scrape per-process compute costs, CPU, memory, disk I.O., network I.O., so that when somebody came to us that, hey, we think DLP is causing a problem, we actually had raw facts to say, we do see that on average, the actual CPU cost is between 0.5 and 1.5% CPU, being the maximum spike that I observed. Uh, but we, think, we don't think it's really us because we're seeing, you know, Chrome and IE and Microsoft Edge are a much heavier burden on the compute cost of the end system. Likewise, I've been very upfront and paranoid as in moving as much off of the actual DLP client as possible and taking it from the DLP client onto what I call the DLP enterprise or the rest of the DLP stack because I do want to be sensitive to the client uh, the, or the client performance of our client systems. And that is one thing that we've taken very seriously originally we were planning to go through and do DLP web inspection on the clients, but a funny little thing happened. I came into work one day, and I got uh, a bunch of calls from the uh, help desk. They say, uh, hey, Micah, we think something's going wrong. Uh, no one, or we've been getting a significant amount of calls that people aren't able to open up Chrome. And so I started to dig into it, and um, what I found out is, is I believe that Google is doing a really good job with a bunch of their efforts out there. And Chrome, it's a great browser. However, the first time that my DLP provider gets the new version of Chrome, it's the same day that my end users. And because there isn't a clear integration, a clear way for my DLP vendor to hook into Chrome, they actually have to reverse engineer 
their hooks to figure out how to go through and how to intercept and how to perform DLP. So, of course, what happened? Google went through, they made additions to Chrome, they made modifications that changed those hooks so that every time my users were going through and they were uh, trying to open it, uh, our DLP client was actually crashing it. That's one reason why we chose to go through and move the DLP uh, web off of the client system and up into the network layer. Another thing I'm very cognizant of is keeping our classifications as lightweight and simple as needed. Keep in mind, every new classification, every new addition to a text dictionary, every new addition to a regular expression dictionary, that has a quantifiable cost in compute resources every time that DLP check is happening. So we need to strike a balance between having a reasonable amount of control and as lightweight of a cost on our end user client systems as possible. Then you're going to face problems like you do with any of our other controls that we put on our client systems. Um, I work for an insurance company. We have road warriors that take it as a battle of pride to be out of the office for two, three, four weeks at a time and not connect back to VPN. So how are they getting their updates? How are they getting their data signatures? That's a real problem that you're going to have to go through and evaluate and come up with a solution around. The client might not even be on every server. So we use a MSSP to help us go through and to push this client out. And I would have to go through and run remediations reports and say, okay, how many clients are active on our network, i.e. they've communicated in two weeks, but do not have a client. Okay, these are the ones that we missed and slowly work our way down until we got a fairly high assurance level. So you're going to need to build in those basic controls into your program. Likewise, the DLP network, it can actually overlap depending on what segments you're sending it with DLP web and DLP email. So my suggestion here, is to pick the tool that will do the best inspection and to limit it to only that tool doing that ex inspection. Uh, honestly, if we don't do that, guys, then we're just going to go through and put ourselves with duplicate incidents created for the same event, and that doesn't do any of us any help. Keep in mind, as I said before, we need to be very careful with access and the protection of the DLP management console and make sure every time we go, or when we set it up and when we run it, that we can meet every rule, law, and regulation for the data that we go through and are collecting. Uh, and finally, when I started with this DLP project, by the way, I've been on a DLP project for the five years of the lead engineer. No sign in leaving it. But um, <laughs> with that being said, every time, or I'm sorry, I used to think that we were going to go through and be a single DLP scan engine shop. At the beginning. Now I'm up to four, possibly a fifth one coming in. And there's a high cost of the fragmentation of policies when we're dealing with multiple different scan engines, and we'll address that in just a little bit. So let's move forward. So I often joke within my organization that the biggest problem data loss prevention has is the name. If you think about it, we are going through and we are inundated with stories of various data breaches. Uh, in fact, I just saw one last night for a company or that Hasbro had in which there for several years, uh, pretty sensitive information was leaked. And so when our senior management start seeing that and it started to come around and they really have started to come around to the whole IT and IT security and I attribute that directly back to what happened with the target investigation. When they see a product that says data loss prevention, their thoughts is this is going to stop all data leaks and it's not. It stops the basic, the accidental, it helps you put controls but it will not stop a sufficiently advanced adversary. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Now, we ran this project in, with many different leaders. First, we had a program coordinator that wanted to be a program coordinator half the time, and half the time wanted to be a product manager. And one of the, one of the actual challenges there is when we, as the uh, 
engineers, as the analysts, were going through and working and building, we would provide one update up one level. And just like a game of telephone, when it got retold, it wasn't the exact same message. And so now senior management is thinking that we're doing one thing when we're actually doing another thing. And then the feedback also went through that same game of telephone. We then went through, and for a period of time, I went through and I accepted the project manager roles. And guys, I'm a terrible project manager, but I'm a good engineer. So I took over the half PM roles, half engineering roles. And when I was able to go through and speak directly with senior management, when I was able to clearly define and articulate what the possibilities, what the true costs were, we were able to make progress relatively quickly <coughs> compared to what we were in the past. When we went from just this being rolled out to the North and South America companies to globally, we had a formal PM, and it did take us a little while to learn her up on the technology, on the lingo, on the cost. But once we went through and uh, did that education, it worked pretty well. But when it comes to running this type of a project, I really think that we need, as engineers, as analysts, need to lead from the ground up and make sure that when we are going to our senior management for the decisions, the scoping, that they understand what the true costs are. So that brings me to the next point. We need to clearly define what is in scope and what is out of scope. I cannot tell you how many times in a week where my scope would change three to four significant times in one week. Guys, it's very hard to hit a moving target. Uh, DLP, one of my favorite questions on DLP is, is this part of your active defense tool set? Or is this just a historical system of what happened? And what I'm trying to illustrate to management is, do we treat this like an IDS, where every alert that meets a certain threshold, we have to have an analyst eyes on there to make sure that something didn't go wrong? Or is this a tool where we're just correct, collecting records, and if there is a need to do an investigation, we can take a look back in the near history and see what actually has happened in our event. You know, to this day, after four or five years, I still don't have an answer to this one very simple, very fundamental question. And we'll talk about that in detail a little bit later. Keep in mind, DLP is designed to find your most sensitive information that most likely if you have a DLP program, you must protect under certain rules, laws, and regulations. And that includes access to the DLP environment in and of itself. DLP, remember, I'm of the firm belief that it is a business tool that IT and or IT security might run. We need to go through and bring the business in early, bring them in often, so that they can go through and they can make informed decisions on what they want to do. It's no secret, guys. I work with my uh, teams out of APAC and EMEA, and I'll tell you, the Europeans have a very progressive view on personal privacy. And that has caused a lot of in interesting opportunities uh, to go through and to address some very challenging issues to get approval from certain European boards. So keep in mind, know what your risk appetites are. Bring the business in so that they can help guide you through this. By the way, who responds to a DLP incident? And what is your internal SLA? Those are very important questions that, as an IT security practitioner, it's my responsibility to ask that to management. It's management's responsibility to articulate that. So the impetus behind this talk was really to give you kind of my experience four years boiled down so you can see where I have failed so, you can, so that you don't have to run into those traps. One of the greatest flubs that I had in this DLP project was we were back in our infancy, just getting ready to uh, roll out to the Americas organizations. And at this time, I had about 10, 12 members of IT security from myself and uh, the other analysts on the project to senior IT security that had the DLP client installed. And one day I was doing some tuning activities and I made a mistake. In one of my data classifications, I made the mistake of going through and leaving off one right 
parentheses. That was it. That's all I did programmatically. And because I did that, I caused a memory overload that slowly but surely took every one of our computers and turned them into a potato. We still call that the great potatoing effect of 2017. So, obviously that wasn't good. So I had to go up to senior management and say, here is exactly why I took all of your systems down. Yes, it was just us, but here's how we're going to go through and prevent this in the future. So we came up with something very simple. I looked at what are we already doing as a business today? Well, for software updates, we have a test, a pilot, and a production set of groups. So I created that for the Americas. But that had interesting consequences because now every classification, I have to have a test, I have to have a pilot, and I have to have a production instance. Every class or every individual regular expression, text dictionary, I had to have three different revisions of that, and that's what I call fragmentation of your DLP policy. The number of environments that you have to support directly will dictate how you have to support your environment, the complexities that are brought in with each one of those. And so one of the challenges is to find a balance between what you need to meet your organization's testing standard and what you as an IT security organization, as an IT organization, can go through and can support. So that's a huge challenge. Now, in general, I don't, we are allowed to do whatever we want them to test. Our pilot, uh, at the time, we were dealing with a total user population of about 8,000 and about 200 total, and our pilot was about 200 that were strategically picked between our individual organizations, all areas of the business, so that we could try to find something out. So general rule is we build and test, we have free reign, we use change control to push out to pilot, and then we have another change control to push out to production. Pretty simple, pretty standard, but you're going to have to figure out what your own strategy is going to be with that. So at one point, I was under huge pressure, and I really didn't understand where this pressure was, because me, I'm a technologist, I'm not a people person. And I knew that we were not getting, we didn't have the policy in a state where we needed. The average person was creating 100 DLP events a day, eight to five. And management was coming at me, Micah, you need to go, we need to show progress to the board. And I was kind of caught off guard. I hadn't done my homework. So the only thing I could say on that call was, Guys, we're not ready. We need to spend more time tuning. The average person is creating about 100 incidents a day. And so I asked management, can you give me 24 hours to go through and to try to think of a solution? I already knew what the solution was, but I needed to quantify it to them. And so I had an outrageous idea. I needed to find a metric that mattered to management. So I had already gone through, and I had been working thousands and thousands of incidents throughout the tuning process. And so I knew that to fully evaluate a DLP incident and be able to trace it back to the source reason, the exact reason why it needed or why it fired and make a ignore, tune, or escalate decision was about five minutes. So I just did simple math. I went through estimated at five minutes a day with the average person creating 100 incidents a day that we'd only need 4,225 <laughs> DLP analysts to cover our eight to five DLP incidents. That's not counting after hours, that's not counting uh, weekends. And they said, Mike, that's not good. What do you recommend? More time tuning. And so when it comes to tuning, going through and doing your first round of tuning, getting the first 80%, that's pretty easy. The next round's a little bit harder and the next and each subsequent round is going to be even harder than that. As a rule of thumb, your default rules are going to stink. I've got a friend, Bruce, very smart guy. Him and I are great friends at work. And he was uh, tangentially assigned to the DLP project in case I were to go through and suffer some outrageous act of fortune. And uh, one day I'm going through my incidents and I've seen wait a minute, Bruce has an incident here, it's an email, and it's a HIPAA violation? Well, number one, I know Bruce is a very security-conscious individual, 
And so I started digging into it, wanting to understand why was this classified as a hippo event. And so as I was going through and digging in, it said something to the effect of, hey, honey, talking to his girlfriend, now fiance, I don't feel like cooking tonight. What do you want from Boston Market? Then below that, by the way, here's the best way to go through and to apply saddle soap, and it was an Amazon link. And I started, that doesn't sound like a HIPAA rule to me. So I started to dig in. And as I was digging in, I was looking at how we defined HIPAA rules, and I'll show some of you this, uh, or this in just a little bit. And what I came up with, one of the dictionaries we had was exceedingly poor. Our medical term was soap. And then we are looking for either a common last name, a U.S. last name, which Harris was in, or a telephone number, or a zip code. Guys, on any email, what's the chance that you're going to have one of those three, if not all three of those, in that email? It's going to be pretty high. It's going to be 80, maybe. But yeah, it's really common to go through and have one of those three plus a medical term. So what did I do to tune it? I said, this default dictionary, it's horrible. And I just dropped it just because of how weak it was. Secondly, we need to learn to love regular expressions. Uh, so my good friend Matt Shearer uh, went through and has a 2017 talk from DerbyCon, Regex 101. It's a stable talk. It's 30 minutes. Uh, if you're not familiar with regular expressions or want to brush up any time somebody comes onto my DLP team, I don't care who they are, they watch that video, period. And then, guys, it's not the undesirable results, the result that I really care about. What really scares me about DLP is introducing false negatives. The DLP events that should have triggered an alert, but because we overtuned, they didn't. So every time I'm making a tuning knob, a decision, I ask myself, how likely is this that it could be used or abused to create false negatives? So that's what really keeps me up at night. In fact, anyone on my team gets tired of me saying this. There are no false positives. There's only poorly written rules. And what I mean by that is I've looked at a lot of DLP incidents. And for the most part, we have gotten really good at writing these computer systems to execute basic logical comparisons and we've gotten really good at it. So when we're constantly going through and saying something's a false negative, what are we saying about our tool? Ah, oh, it's giving us rubbish. It's wasting our time. It's putting our tool down. Instead, what I went through and what I started to do mm -hmm. is I started to go through and measure incidents on validity and accuracy. Accuracy is does the actual detection make mathematical sense. So stripping out human emotion, just looking at here's what the classification is looking for, here's the data input, do I agree with the computer, yes or no? That's accuracy. Validity is does it go through and catch what we're intending? So if I'm going through and I'm looking for a US driver's license and I get a user's log on ID, that might be highly accurate, but it's low validity, right? So once I started going through and socializing our team, especially the uh, technical team, our analysts on this philosophy, it almost put our mindset more in how can we improve the tool? How can we improve our algorithms? How can we improve our data classification? And that was a huge win in building trust in the system to me. So let's take a little bit and talk about the architecture. So traditional DLP classifications they are built upon regular expressions, text dictionaries, and other types of Boolean logic. This can be problematic. So the United States of America is currently compromised of 50 different states. Each state has the legal authority to declare a driver's license every which way they wish. Uh, and I'll show you this in just a moment. Likewise, many of our favorite social media sites, the ends of links, the book of faces, they go through and embed in their URL a 15, 16 digit character, numeric character. What does that look like to a computer? It looks like a credit card, right? I've even gone through and run some of them through the link check and they pass. Obviously, we have to do better. When you're building your data classifications, always follow the primary rule of improv comedy and yes, 
and statements. Um, I tripped over that. We'll talk about that in a minute. Proximity rules are your friend where you're looking for condition A and condition B within so many characters of, your, of each other are a huge win. So guys, right here is a sample of a, and it's a little bit old, but this is how we documented our DLP rules and we continue to this day. So I'm going to walk you through this a little bit. So the first part is the actual classification. Now within our DLP environment, a classification can have many different classification criteria, but the hit is always on the classification. The first thing that I want to point out is to help our analysts. I always begin with a short code. So CLT V11 DEF. So that stands for client version 11 default. So just by looking at the start of any customizable config, my analysts, my engineers know exactly where that piece belongs in our environment. That's a huge win for documentation and something that I am so glad that we keyed on to earlier. The second row, it's basically just a quick description of what it's trying to do. So one classification can have many classification criteria and a, a match on any classification criteria will result on a hit on that classification level. The third column is what type of rule is it? Is it a proximity rule, meaning it's looking for condition A and condition B within so many spaces? Is it a, just an advanced pattern by itself? Uh, is it just a dictionary? So we're just kind of giving a little bit of definition on what it's look or what it, what type of rule it is at a high level. And then the rightmost, that's actually the rule itself. So the words in blue are the actual configuration items that we're looking for. So in the top one there, we're looking for a credit card number. So we have a bunch of pre-built uh, regular expression dictionaries, patterns that we're looking for. Plus, we're looking for a dictionary. And by the way, when I'm building dictionaries, if they're a text dictionary, I append that text to the end. If they're a regular expression, I append EXPR. Once again, that's just a little labeling hint to help my analysts know and my engineers know exactly what we're looking for. And they're found within 90 characters of each other and at least one point in time. So just by going through and having this, this is a living, breathing document. I can give to my auditors, internal, external, that I can actually take to the business and say, this is how DLP works. It helps me because when I'm troubleshooting DLP, I'll pull it up and I'll take a, and I'll filter just on the classification I'm hitting and I'll use this documentation. Okay, why in the world did I go through and did I have a hit on that? Because at the end of the day, I've got to understand which of these three PCI classification criteria I hit to incur that classification. So this is very critical for troubleshooting as well as just good hygiene. So this is something that I highly recommend that we go through and to do with our environment. So guys, right here's our driver's license. Everything on the left here is how we define it. And then when we started to look into it, we saw that we were getting unintentional collisions. Everything from our change tickets to our incident tickets to our problem tickets our user IDs, our contractor IDs, um, something as simple as year, 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 month, month, day, day, or day, day, month, month, year, 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 year notations would be hit on as an actual driver's license. That's problematic. So this is where Micah screwed up again. My first attempt was we created a classification called driver's license that was just looking for that regular expression dictionary that I just showed you. And then I created a not driver's license. And that's looking for that same text dictionary plus text that indicate that what we matched was not a driver's license. So this was things like tele or mobile or meeting code within so many characters. And guys, this would have worked great if all I cared about was driver's license. But I'm an insurance organization. I care about HIPAA, GLB, uh, PCI, on top of just U.S. driver's license. So when I would go through and did the create an incident, I was actually excluding anything that had a not driver's license. And that was a huge window for false negatives to be accrued on our environment. So what did I do? I followed the primary role of improv comedy. 
I edited how we defined driver's license by adding a yes and. So what we did was we implemented this simple hack here. So driver's license, we're still looking for the same regular expression match plus a text dictionary that indicate a positive correlation to a driver's license. So that was words like driver or license or vehicle or LIC number or LIC colon or VIN. Just something that would indicate that we had a true detection here. And that took our driver's license from our worst classification to one of our tightest best performing overnight. And that was a huge win. So I often joke about weaponizing our users when it comes to data <laughs> classification. Mm -hmm. And while that is true, it's more about inviting them to be proper data stewards. And this is where meta tagging of DL or documents with DLP meta tags is an absolutely huge win. Within our organization, we have a data classification code that we go through and that we actually enforce. We are using a very popular software to go through and to allow our users, when they save a document that doesn't already have a meta tag data defined in it, it'll get a little pop-up. Hello, we at company uh, care very much about the sensitivity and the protection of our data. Please help us classify your data. And then if the, the user is prompted like A1, public, A2, private, A3, uh, sensitive, and if the user hovers over that, a little pop-up will go through and come up and it'll say, hey, this is what it means to be a public document, what it means to be a private document. And it's great because now we're going through and inviting our users to come in. We're giving them a reminder that we do care about the security of our data every time they save a document. Now, what's great about this is not only by classifying your data with meta tags, since that's in the header of a document, you're not only enriching DLP, you're also enriching the rest of your tool set. So uh, you'll find that many other common tools that you already have in your environment can go through and can read those headers and can go through and have increased functionality based on them. And that's an actual huge win. Since we went through and rolled out this data classification uh, meta tag, I've actually had an increase of times where the business has proactively come to me and said, hey, we are wanting to do X. Can you help us design a way to do it better? And I really do think it's because we've started to go through and to include them in making more decisions about the sensitivity of our data, and I think that is a huge win. So what we're going to talk about next is actually my strategy in building a DLP policy. Anyone familiar with the book Dune? The first four are good, after that it gets a little bit weird. <laughs> that being said, uh, we've been hired by Paul Atreides to go through and to build a DLP policy for his Galactic or Federation. So as you can see, we are going to be on the planet Arrakis, and we are friends with a couple planets and we're enemies with others. So the first part about building a good DLP policy is knowing the players. Next, we make a map of how the spice, I mean data, must flow. So here we can go through and we can clearly see that we are going to be Arrakis here. And we are friends with Chapter House and friends with Kaladin. But we are enemies with Gili Prime and Corrin. So we simply create a data flow map. Pretty simple, right? I found that oftentimes a picture is a thousand words. The next thing that we do is we create our data classifications. So A1 is going to be public. It can be shared freely and openly with anyone. Think about a weather forecast. A2 is proprietary to be used only by the Arrakis government or our allies. A3 is diplomatic. So this is something that is free to be shared, but we, have, we must maintain the integrity of that communication. We must digitally sign it, for example. A4 is internal. It cannot be transmitted outside of the Arrakis government. And A5 is top secret and has to be limited to just senior members of the Arrakis government. So now we have our data classification policy. Next thing, we overlay what's allowed on our data flow map. This is a great way that when you talk to your business, you can go through and you can quantify with them what 
our intent when we build out this policy, and they can say yes or they can say no. The next thing is to go through and to build it out in whatever documentation you choose. This is the format that worked best for me, and I had to do this per tool, per classification, but just through all of our various DLP, uh, what we're going to go through and to do with each classification. Um, so once again, this worked for me. You might prefer a different level of actual documentation, but this is something that I can give to my auditors. This is something that I can use to go through and to implement, which is absolutely huge. I'm a big fan of being open and transparent with everyone. Um, so now the fun part, how to detect by and bypass any DLP solution. So guys, let's put on our black hats. Once you get a shell on a remote system, put some of the first things that you look, look at. You might want to know, who am I running as? You might want to know, where am I? So you might look at your IP config. Another common technique is what active controls are on this system. So you can take a look at the running processes. Very common, right? All of these DLP products, if they're running on that system, they're going to show up when you run those processes. So it's just a fact of life. We have to assume a malicious adversary is going to be able to tell if one of our client systems are running a DLP. Now, I would assert that a sufficiently advanced adversary should at all times be running trust no one encryption anytime they are acting in a network that is not their own, heck, probably even in their own network. But without the help of a device to go through and to break encryption, pretty much all DLP is going to fall flat. So as long as a malicious adversary can encrypt or even obfuscate the data, it's trivial for them to transform even by adding dashes between, say, a social security or a credit card. Something that little of a transformation is enough to break most all current DLP products. Uh, likewise, the repository scanners, they are very susceptible to the actual introduction of any type of cryptography or data obfuscation. Now, some people might assert, great, we're, we'll just go through, we'll MTM ourselves, we'll break the encryption ourselves, but that's also very risky. So first off, if you are working within certain environments uh, globally, you may or may not have the right to go through and to MTM to break encryption on certain protected uh, traffic such as web traffic. Uh, it's just a fact uh, and you'll have to bring in your legal team to see if this is something that you can do. However, I have had a friend that has gone through and they chose to MTM themselves so that they could go through and inspect web traffic. And that's great from a policy enforcement level. The challenge came is that they got hit by a very <coughs> nasty bug because within their, the mechanism in which they were MTMing themselves, there's a misconfiguration that resulted in the cryptographic standards exiting that box out to the internet being a lower value than what would have been if they were not going to go through an MTM themselves. So there's a high cost if you do choose to break cryptography and we need to make sure that we do it respectfully and in accordance with best practice so that we don't accidentally decrease our security. Um, and finally, keep in mind, DLP incidents, they can provide us as offensive people with a whole lot of very interesting information. And I know I'm wrapping up a little bit early. I want to thank you for your time and any questions. Thank you.